I received a phone call late last night and I was up. I was working on my message for uh, this morning and uh, somebody had called me and they were just <coughs> broken. They had an issue that um, seemed to them impossible and difficult and they didn't know what to do or where to turn. So I told them, well, I know the one that can fix your problem and I know the one that can resolve it. No, it's not get this. This isn't, you don't understand and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, if you keep telling me <laughs> it's impossible, I said, you're not allowing God to enter in and, and even begin to, to work on this particular situation. So I said, you know, why don't you just be quiet and let's pray. So I started praying with them and um, we prayed for a moment. They didn't want to pray at all. They just kept telling me their situation just was was more than they could handle and you know uh, so difficult and um, so we left it at that I said I'll continue to pray I said before uh, uh, before the night's over I'll pray again and I'll pray again in the morning and um, it was funny because um, about an hour ago about nine o'clock they called me and it's like you know, I don't want to be interrupted right now I'm thinking about my sermon and um, <laughs> You know, reluctantly, I answered the phone this morning because I thought it was just going to be the same thing, their negativity. And they're like, Pastor, you wouldn't believe it. The situation that you, I called you about last night was resolved. And it's like, well, I had the faith to believe it was. You didn't. <laughs> I thought they were just going to continue their, like, this is impossible. I don't know what to do scenario. And it's like, well, I told you God can work this out. I told you it could be resolved. But I don't recommend you calling me during the night for that prayer. So, <laughs> just, <laughs> uh, but it's just interesting. You know, when you have faith, God can, God can move a mountain. Even if you think that mountain's immovable. Amen. Well, this morning, I'm continuing my series in Romans chapter 9. And... Um, the, this morning's message is called Stumbling Stone or Cornerstone with a big question mark. We're going to be looking at the last verses of Romans chapter 9. We've worked our way through uh, Romans 9. So let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll get into this morning's message. I ask you to turn off your cell phones because it's rather distracting to everybody when we have phones continually going off. Believe me, people can wait the three hours of this message for you to get back with them. So we'll leave it at that. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, I thank you for this morning and I thank you for this day. Lord, this is the day that you have made. We choose to rejoice and we choose to be glad in it because the psalmist told us so. And Lord, we believe that. Bless us with this word as it goes forth. Help us with wisdom and understanding. Help us to know that your word is true and your promises are real. And your promises will come to pass. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for what you're going to do in our hearts and in our minds. Let us put aside the cares of this world for the short period of time so we could receive the download directly from you, Father God. That you would download into our spirits the words and the wisdom that you would have us to receive and then live out. Thank you for that word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week's sermon was called Straight Talk About Predestination. And, um, you know, I, I think if I was giving somebody else some advice about that particular message, I would probably say a title like that is just asking for trouble. And um, I think it's hard for many people to understand that particular topic because people have to come to grips with the whole question of God's sovereignty and our free will, and how the two work together. And um, it was funny because um, I, um, I talked to a couple people um, last week about this, and um, you know, the, somebody told me, well, I didn't struggle with this particular issue until you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> they said that, uh, you know, um, uh, after they had heard the, the message, you know, they said that... Um, that um, you know their significant other and them had a difference of opinion on the whole topic, and um, they said that they've been a Christian their whole life, and they were embarrassed that it took them so long 
to actually figure this out. And they said that um, you know the, the conversation at home became heated and the debate between them uh, was was interesting after the service. So if I've caused any upheaval in your in your lives, I'm sorry. I just preach the word of God and and let it uh, and do its work as it as it may. So, um, you know, um, you know, I think, um, you know, um, what Tim Keller had to to say. Um, he's a, a a modern day big time pastor. You know, he said, you know, he was. He was talking about um, and tempted to say that this doctrine of um, predestination just isn't fair. And um, then he said, let me give you two points. First, you don't know enough about the choosing process to make the call, whereas God predestines or chooses who he, he, who he so feels are, 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 are his chosen. And sec- secondly, no one can say God you know, hasn't been fair to me. And I think those two ideas are exactly right, you know. And um, I'm also pretty comfortable with um, another pastor, Charles Simeon, and uh, his quote on this particular message was this: "You know, when I come to this text which speaks of election, I delight myself in the doctrine of election. When the apostles exhort me to repentance and obedience, and indicate my freedom of choice and election, I give myself up to that side of the question." So this morning, as we come to the end of Romans chapter 9, and there's a heavy emphasis on God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty in terms of our salvation, the question arises of how can we know who is chosen by God and who is not chosen? Paul already suggested several answers to this particular question, and in verses 4 and 5, he points out that despite all of Israel's advantages, most Jews rejected Jesus. I mean, it seems kind of strange. These are God's chosen people, and you would think if God personally sent a Messiah and a Savior to them, that they'd be all in, but that certainly wasn't the case. So it's not a matter of religious heritage. See, a lot of people think they're getting to heaven because of their religious pedigree or religious heritage, But if that was the case, all Jews would be in, but that's not true. Paul goes even further and and, and says this, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. We see that in verse 6. And to think that this is just some ho-hum statement, you know, it must have been like an electric shock to the first century Jews. See, we all like to think that we have certain advantages because of our background, because of our heritage, or because of our upbringing. In this world, we're so accustomed to the notion that your birth and your education bring certain advantages. People who graduate from a particular school or college, they look out for each other. They have fraternities and they have um, bonds that are formed there that last forever. If you come from a particular school, you have certain advantages. My, my son, uh, my oldest son, who is my namesake son, Curtis, he went to a prestigious college in Boston, and that gave him a certain pedigree in terms of what he would do with his life and how that would work out, and it helped him get a, a good job. But, you know, some people graduate from Notre Dame or UCLA or maybe even Georgia Tech. You know, that alone gives you the opportunity to interview in certain circles that's not available to other people. It can even get you a job in some cases. And, you know, it's interesting because in big cities, you know, you have Mexican town, you have you have uh, Pole town, and you have Greek town, and you have all of these particular different distinct distinctive areas where people of a certain race or a certain heritage join together and those people who live in those neighborhoods use their connections to get ahead and and to have certain advantages in life and that's the way of the world sometimes you know there there there's some um, there's certain advantages to being uh, in a certain place at a certain time and you know some people you know, they use their friendships or their connections because, you know, they, they've been to the same school or they have a 
shared common interest with somebody, you know, to, to make something happen. And, you know, this doesn't surprise me at all. This week, a matter of fact, a couple people, they were looking um, to, to, um, to use a reference and they called me and they said, you know, could we use your name as a reference? I don't know what that would do for them, but they thought it was important. You know, if they put, you know, I'm connected to Pastor Curtis, I don't know. Um, you know, but, you know, whatever connections people think they have, you know, they try to use them. And that's not a bad thing. That's the way the world works. Using your connections or your heritage or your position or your status or the school you went to. But I got good news for you this morning. It doesn't work that way with God. See, no one has an in with God. No one can use the connection to say, well, you know, I have a way with God. I can use him as a reference on my resume. Not even the Jews who had all the advantages that Paul mentions in verses 4 and 5 of this text uh, could use that to their advantage. They had the promises of the Old Testament. They had the covenants of God. They had the law. They had the prophets. They had the patriarchs. And, Jew, and Jesus himself was of Jewish descent. But none of these things mattered when it came to salvation. See, because not all the Jews were saved. They had every possible advantage, but they weren't saved. And Paul goes on to point out that since God is the author of salvation, God can choose who he pleases. And that's the whole point of election and predestination. God chooses who he pleases. Some people think that's not fair, and some people have an issue with that, but that brings us back to a fundamental question. How do we know the ones who are chosen, and how do we know the ones who are not chosen? And the answer is this. We don't know, at least not by outward appearances. See, no one can look at a crowd of people and say, you're chosen, you're not chosen. It doesn't work that way. So how then do we know who is in and who is out? Who God chooses and who God doesn't choose? Paul gives us the answer in verses 30 through 33, and it's surprisingly simple. We know who is chosen and who is not chosen by one method. How they respond to Jesus. Amen. See, as we look at these verses, remember that Paul is dealing with the Gentiles as a group and with the Jews also as a group. And he wants us to understand why so many Gentiles believe in Jesus and why so many Jews don't believe in Jesus. So we have two groups and two destinies. The first group is the Gentiles. And in verse 30, it reads as follows. What then shall we say? that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. See, the Gentiles as a group didn't care about finding God's righteousness. They weren't looking for it. They weren't trying to, to find it. They weren't looking or seeking after it. But the interesting thing is, even though they weren't looking for it, they found it anyways. Amen. See, as far as the Gentiles go, their idol worship was just so much as somebody that's groping in the dark. You know, like, you know, when the electricity's off and you're trying to find something. Just groping in the dark, not being able to see very well, but, you know, you're trying to find something. And there's more than they just worshiped idols. Because as they continued to worship their idols... They got further and further and further away from God. And that's Paul's whole point in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32. See, God revealed himself to everyone in creation. God revealed himself to everyone in their conscience. But everyone by nature actually rejects God. Everyone by nature suppresses this truth. And the truth they rejected actually leads to idolatry. You see, one thing most people don't understand about idolatry, 
Idolatry opens the door to sexual immorality. And sexual immorality leads to every other sort of sin. Until finally what happens is, society just gets to the point, and we're pretty much there in America, where society just utterly rejects God in totality. And the final end to all of this is that moral values are turned upside down so that God be, that, so that God becomes less to everybody. And when God becomes less or irrelevant, then something else happens. Evil becomes good, and good becomes evil. That's actually in Isaiah uh, chapter 5, verse 20. Um, yeah. It says exactly that. You know, good becomes evil and evil becomes good. Let me just check that particular verse real quick. It says, Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if with a cart rope. They say, Let him make speed and hasten his work. For we may see it, And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come, that we may know it. Woe to those, woe, meaning, I feel sorry for those. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to the mighty men at drinking wine. Woe to the men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. See, it says, woe to those. Woe, 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 woe. If you've ever uh, had anything to do with agriculture or farming and you've been on a horse, you know what woe means. It yeah. means, you know, pull that bit back as far as you can. There's trouble ahead. And if you don't know what woe means, well, I feel sorry for you. Because what will happen is you'll just go too far. But really, that's what we've done in this world. I mean, we've thrown the Bible out of school. We've we've thrown prayer out of school. You know, we've we, we've embraced evil. I mean, just this week, our, our president signed a bill that America would, would support and pay for abortions worldwide. I mean, it doesn't give much more evil than that. I don't understand how somebody can, can claim to be a devout Catholic and then allow such evil and then allow American taxpayers' money to be used worldwide to pay for abortions worldwide. And now we have this other crazy thing called birthday abortions. Our governor in Michigan thinks it's a great idea. You can kill a nine-month-old baby as long as it's not born. They've already legalized it in. They already legalized it in Illinois. They legalized it in the state of New York, where it's called a birthday abortion. You can deliver a baby full term, fully developed, a full, full, full functioning baby. You can kill it on its birthday or you can deliver it on, on its birthday. It doesn't matter. And, and the evil governor of New York s- celebrated that and everybody applauded him when he signed that bill into law. I mean, that's what it means that evil becomes good. See, when a society reaches the bottom, evil isn't just tolerated, it's celebrated and promoted. And those who oppose evil, they're marginalized and ostracized. See, this is Paul's picture of the Gentiles as a whole. And it's not a pretty picture. You know, it said, they did not pursue righteousness, meaning they had wanted nothing to do with righteousness. It means that they were religious, or they thought they were religious, but they didn't seek the living God. They didn't want the living God. And they certainly didn't want God on his terms. See, because God doesn't come on your terms. That's what most people think. God comes with his terms. 
And now we come to the wonder of this gospel. See, the Gentiles weren't seeking salvation. But it's interesting that most of them found it anyway. They were messed up. They were screwed up. They were fouled up. They were confused. They were disoriented. They were broken, completely broken by their own sinful choices. They were utterly deceived by idols that they worshipped. They were deeply stained by sin, and they were tainted by their own immorality. And as a group, the Gentiles, and as I told you previously in this series, that's 99.999% of us, and 99.999% of the human race, they're one sorry lot. And the, and the issue is that. I'm a Gentile, and you're a Gentile. Most of us are Gentiles, meaning non jew But it pleased God to reveal His Son to us and to offer salvation to us if only we could receive it one way, and that's by faith. Amen. What a novel concept that God had. This is like a mind-blowing idea. It's that simple, by faith, simple faith. And then it's a free gift, total forgiveness. Your sins are washed away. You're totally pardoned. You're declared righteous. You're given eternal life. You're brought into God's family. You have a new life in Christ. You get a fresh start. No wonder the Gentiles wanted this and they went running after it. See, we were so messed up, us Gentiles, we had no other choice. Our sin left us so broken that we jumped at the offer of God's free grace. Amen. Who wouldn't take a deal like that? God's free grace. See, we weren't exactly looking for it, and we definitely didn't deserve it. Amen. But God, in His mercy, took us in. And we obtained what we could have never dreamed even possible. You know, it's funny because as I was putting these words together, I was smiling on the inside. You know, and who wouldn't smile? It's a miracle of God's grace, pure and simple. Amen. To borrow a phrase, you know, from that game show, deal or no deal. Amen. See, God offered us the gospel. God offered us salvation. Then he looked us square in the eye and said, deal or no deal. And the Gentile said, deal! Amen. That's how we're included in the first place. See, the other group, the Jews, we see what they did in verses 31 and 32. It says, but Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, but has not attained it. And then it says, why not? With a question mark. Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. See, by contrast, the Jews uh, scrupulously obeyed the law. I mean, they followed, they tried to follow the, the law to the letter. See, they offered a river of animal blood at the altar of sacrifice, trying to do everything God wanted. They kept their dietary laws. They established the royal priesthood. And in general, they tried to play by the rules. And if they did such a good job of trying to follow all the rules, what went so wrong? See, if they did what God said, then why weren't all of them saved? And the answer comes down to this. They thought they were saved simply by keeping all the rules. But that can't save them. Nope. See, just following the rules doesn't save anyone. Amen. Amen. It comes down to this. The motivation of the heart. Right. See, they thought by keeping the rituals year after year, they thought by following God's ordinances and rules, that's all that God required. But the whole point of the law was 
not to be followed. The whole point of the law is to point us to Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus Christ came, He would one day fulfill all the law in His life, in His death, and in His resurrection. See, just to go through the motions ultimately meant turning the law, which is good, into a kind of do-it-yourself religion of works. See, if you learn just to follow the law, really, you're just following a religion, not a relationship with God. We see the same thing today when people say, I was raised Catholic, so I must be going to heaven and I must be a Christian. No, that doesn't work that way. Some people say, you know, I've been a member of the Baptist church and I was baptized there, so I know I'm going to heaven. That's also the wrong answer. Some people say, well, my children were baptized as infants, so I know all of my children are saved. And that's not right either. You see, religion cannot save you. Church membership cannot save you. Mm -hmm. Good religious rituals cannot save you. Trying hard to be good cannot save you. Playing by the rules cannot save you. Keeping the Ten Commandments cannot save you. Baptism cannot save you. Giving money cannot save you. Mm -hmm. Being a pastor cannot save you. Becoming a missionary cannot save you. Reading the Bible cannot save you. Serving the poor cannot save you. Visiting the sick cannot save you. Visiting those incarcerated in prison cannot save you. Even being nice cannot save you. None of these things are bad or wrong or evil. See, as I went through this list and made this list, it all looks pretty good to me. You know, we ought to do these things. It's good things to do. We ought to live this way if we can. But they don't make an ounce of difference when it comes to going to heaven. See, if you want to go to heaven, you have to do one thing. You have to deal with Jesus. See, you can't avoid him. And you can't use religion, even good religion, as a substitute for the Son of God. Amen. See, you have to understand one thing. We are saved by faith. We're not saved by religion. Amen. But we are not saved by faith in religion. We're saved by faith In Jesus Christ. See the Jews stumbled over this point. And that's why so many of the Jews. Miss salvation. Then and now. See. Paul isn't arguing that the Gentiles are good. And the Jews are bad. Far from that. What Paul's really saying is. That we're all in the same boat. And the boat is going down. (laughs) See, if you think you can save yourself by treading water, (laughs) treading water with your good works, treading water by following the rules, you're going to drown for sure. (laughs) Just as surely as a mass murderer, (laughs) he thinks that he's going to drown because he'll sink like a rock all the way to the bottom of the ocean. When it comes to going to heaven, this is how God's plan works. No one has an advantage over anyone else. It's all about Jesus and how you respond to Jesus. That's the difference between heaven and hell. You see, if you look at verse 33, it says this, As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that causes them to fall. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. The him here is Jesus. Mm -hmm. See, to prove his point, the Apostle Paul combines two verses from Isaiah. One verse from Isaiah 8, one verse from Isaiah 28, into one verse. The beginning and end come from Isaiah 28, verse 16. And the phrase, a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock 
that causes them to fall, that comes from Isaiah 8, verse 14. And Paul's taken these two verses, both of them very familiar to the Jews, and he's combined them to show that Jesus is both a stumbling stone and a cornerstone. See, to some, he is a stone that causes men to stumble. To others, Jesus is the cornerstone of life. Amen. Those who stumble over Jesus fall to their own destruction. And those who build their lives on Jesus will never be put to shame. That's exactly what our text says. Picture a huge flat stone that's hidden in the grass. Some people never see the stone because they're merely looking ahead and they don't look down. Because they don't see it, when they come across the stone, they stumble and they fall. Others walk through the grass more slowly, carefully, uncertain of what lies ahead. Their head is down and their eyes are fixed on the ground. They see the stone, and instead of tripping over it, they stand on it. Amen. And the same stone that trips one person absolutely supports another person. Amen. And that's what Jesus is like. Many people stumble over him when he came the first time. Amen. See, the religious people stumbled over him because they were offended by his teachings. They were offended on hypocrisy. The Pharisees stumbled because they were offended by the fact that he chose to associate with people that they didn't associate with. God forbid that this Jesus, who's the Messiah, would associate with tax collectors and prostitutes. See, the Romans, they were offended and they stumbled because they were offended he upset the public peace in their town. And 2,000 years have passed, and people to this day still stumble over Jesus. See, they still find his message too controversial, too challenging, too simplistic, or too humbling. It's not true that to know Jesus is to love him. Actually, many people know all about Jesus and don't love him one bit. See, because if you truly love someone, you follow them. You reverence them. You want to have the best of them in you. I can think of at least three reasons why men and women still to this day stumble over Jesus. The first one is this. Because they're offended by the exclusiveness of his claims. A lot of people have a big problem with this. See, we live in this relativistic age. Many people are offended by any suggestion that there's only one way to salvation. You. you can talk about a generic God. Everybody's cool with that. You can talk about being spiritual. That's not a problem either. But when you tell them Jesus is the only way, mm. oh my goodness, yeah. we have a problem. <laughs> but that's precisely what Jesus meant when he said this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's actually on our sign outside, John 14, 6. These are the words of Jesus. He didn't say, I'm a way. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I'm not just one possibility. I'm the exclusive way. Amen. See, these words, <clears throat> excuse me, they must be taken at face value. See, a lot of us, we, we read things like this and we don't understand what God really meant. See, we have no right to water down what Jesus has said. No. You know, sometimes people speak as if Jesus was some kind of great moral teacher. I know I, I, I have a, a relationship with an imam and that's what he tells me all, all the time. Your God was a great moral teacher. And that's it. See, the people who say that he's only a great moral teacher, they don't like John 14, 6. Because Jesus defines exactly who he is. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, 
comes to the Father except through him. Amen. See, it doesn't fit their concept of a great moral teacher. If Jesus isn't the way, the truth, and the life, if there really is another way to the Father, then Jesus isn't a great moral teacher. That's right. He isn't the he isn't anything. He's either the most deceived man in all of history or he's a liar. I remember the book I read one time, Lord, Liar, or Lunatic. You get to pick. Amen. You know, in either case, he's not a great teacher. You can't pick and choose with Jesus. Amen. You either take what he says at absolute face value, or you might as well reject him altogether. Praise God. See, there's only two choices. You either receive him fully or reject him completely. The second reason a lot of people still stumble over Jesus is this. Because they are offended by the implications of the cross. You know, today everything offends everybody, you know. And, um, you know, and this is one of those things. You know, it's funny because a while back, a couple of pastor friends of mine you know, we were, we were talking to somebody who was investigating the claims of Jesus Christ. And during the, the lunch and the course of this conversation, you know, he told us that Jesus was basically a good man who said many helpful and beneficial things. But he had trouble with the concept of Jesus as the Son of God. He said the cross especially perplexed him. He said... I don't see why Jesus had to die for my sins or for anybody else's sins. He said, none of this makes any sense to me. See, he was giving voice to a common problem many unbelievers have when they're brought face to face with Jesus himself. They like the man because instinctively they see in him the one who speaks with uncommon wisdom and grace and mercy. But the cross is a Holy, another matter. Many people stumble over the cross because it implies that they themselves are sinners. See, that Jesus died, yes, they can grasp that, for all men must someday die. That Jesus was crucified, yep, they can accept that because it's a historical fact. (coughs) But they struggle with the fact and the concept that Jesus died for them. To say that it means and implies that they themselves deserve death for their own sins, the sins that they've committed. So the rationale is this. Why would Jesus die for them? See, many people just can't simply deal with the fact of the cross. The third reason a lot of people reject Jesus is because they're offended by the simplicity of salvation. You know, so many people want to do something for their salvation, add something to their salvation. They want Jesus, but they want to throw in their contribution too. So they think they have to do something. They join a church or they get baptized or they give money or they try to help other people or they give to cancer research or you know, they try to be, be good people in their community. Maybe they coach a little league team. Or they try to find some other way to be a pillar and better than other people in their community. And all of these things are good. All of these things are commendable. But all of these things are useless as far as salvation is concerned. <clears throat> See... Jesus said this, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew 18, 2. See, you have to change. If you really have Jesus, he's changing you through the power of his spirit. See, unless you change and become like little children... You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What could be simpler than childish faith? The childish faith of a little girl who looks trustingly into the face 
of her father. Yeah, I was absolutely amazed when my kids were little. My son climbed into this big oak tree that we had in our backyard. And just out of the blue, are you ready, Dad? And he jumped, <laughs> assuming that his father was going to be there to catch him. And I was like, wow, if, if I wasn't on my game, I would have let this kid thump on the ground. But that's the trust that a little child has in their parent. That's right. You know, they put total trust, like, my daddy's always going to be there. My daddy's going to be there no matter what. And thus, my son jumped from that tree. Well, about a year later, I put a swing in that same tree. I wasn't home at the time, so I can't take responsibility for this. But my kid loved that swing. He would swing back and forth and back and forth. And then he decided to jump off the swing. He fell on the ground and broke his leg. True story. See, there was nobody there to catch him. Children put so much faith in their parents when they have good parents that, you know, they trustingly believe that their parents can solve everything for them. Amen. See, this little girl who trustingly looks into the faith, face of her father, she innocently believes every word he says. It never crosses her mind not to believe him. So, little children, unless they've been in a bad situation... They learn to trust their father completely. See, salvation is simple because Jesus did all the work. See, it's free because Jesus paid the price for your sin. And it's a gift because all you need to do is receive it. But some people are too proud to bend their knee to Jesus. They think, I'll work it out someday. Well, good luck with that. You know, I'm going to do it on my terms. Well, good luck with that. See, some people are offended by a salvation that comes to them as a free gift. I must have to do something because that's kind of how the world works. I work, I get paid, I do this, I get that. I do this and something else happens. So we're not used to just being handed something as a free gift. See, a lot of people, they want to do something to feel like they made a contribution to their salvation. They don't want a Jesus-only salvation. Most people want a Jesus-and-me salvation. Like, I contributed to part of this. You didn't contribute anything. Hallelujah, Father. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Bob Harrington. Bob Harrington was a popular guy in the 60s, and I'm from the 60s, and... Um, I remember receiving one of his books. He gained his fame because he was the chaplain of Bourbon Street. If you know anything about Bourbon Street, that's in New Orleans or New Orleans. But for a number of years, God gave him a powerful ministry to the musicians and the singers and the barkers and the gamblers and the prostitutes who frequented the famous French Quarter down in New Orleans. I had a copy of his book, and he wrote this when he was at the peak of his ministry. A whole chapter is devoted to the prostitutes that he personally led to Christ. And I was struck by a statement that came from his book. He said that he always found it easy to win prostitutes for Christ to Christ because the prostitutes already knew that they were great sinners. He said, you didn't have to convince them of that. All you had to do, he said, is show them love and give them hope for a better and different life. Yep. Amen. He said, the ones who were much harder to win, they were the Baptist deacons down in the French Quarter. Because, he said, they had so much religion, they didn't think they needed more Jesus or any Jesus. And I thought about it. I was reminded of Jesus' words himself. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's Luke 5, 32. See, are prostitutes worse sinners than Baptist deacons? Probably not, or not really. 
But they both need Jesus. Amen. But one thinks he's good enough. The other knows that she's not. Mm. And that's why it's easier to win a prostitute than a deacon to Christ. Amen. See, religious people are often offended by the simplicity of salvation. Amen. Sinners are delighted because they realize that a simple salvation is their only chance and their only hope to make it to heaven. You see, that brings us back to the central point of our text. Jesus is God's stone placed along the highway of life. Some people stumble over it. Other people stand on it. Amen. And other people stand on the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. that cornerstone. For some, Jesus is the stone of stumble, stumbling. For others, Jesus is the very cornerstone and foundation of life. Amen. The same stone causes one to, sum, one to stumble and causes others to stand firm. Mm -hmm. See, this observation leads to one simple conclusion. Your eternal destiny hangs on your personal response to Jesus Christ. Let me repeat that just to make sure we're clear. Your eternal destiny hinges and hangs on your personal response to Jesus. Amen. You see, those who attempt to find salvation through works, they're like the Jews who stumbled over Jesus. They don't see him, or if they did see him, they ignore him because they're too busy trying to establish their own righteousness before Almighty God. So they stumble over Jesus, and they fall to their own destruction. Donald Gray Barnhouse, the great pastor of the early 19th century, he summed it up this way. He said, men look for something big. Put, God put Christ into this world as a low-lying low stone, hid amongst the tall grass of a distant Roman providence. Men held their eyes too high and walked across the world, not seeing Christ as God's only answer to their problems. And they tripped over him and stumbled when they came upon him suddenly. They were offended by a scheme of salvation, which brings man to nothingness, and they refused God's way. <clears throat> See, there's another group of people, however, they trudge along through life, deeply aware of their own sinfulness and their own shortcomings. They know they aren't perfect. They try and they fail. They try and they fail. And they try and they fail again. They know that salvation must come from outside their own heart because their own heart is not right. Listen to Dr. Barnhouse as he describes this group. They come through the tangled grass of the world, with their eyes low upon their own bleeding feet, scarred with their own walk on the road of sin. When they have come to the stone, they have been willing to stand on it and ask for nothing further. They have perceived God's word about the Lord Jesus Christ as one day being the only way of salvation. Hallelujah. They have abandoned their goal they have abandoned their road, their strength, their pride, and they have taken their stand squarely on the Lord Jesus Christ. To them comes the trumpeted promise from the God of the universe. Whoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Amen. You see, there's a famous hymn of the church that says it so well. It goes as follows. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. See, we have the eternal promise of God. That the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Amen. 
This means that you'll never be sorry that you gave your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. See, you may go through a thousand disappointments in this life, yes. but you'll never regret your decision to say yes to Jesus Christ. Amen. But the day is coming when many people will be ashamed. Mm -hmm. They will stand before God embarrassed that they wasted their entire life in pursuits that weren't godly. Some people pursued material things. Some people pursued their flesh and the lusts of their flesh, nope. sexual pleasures, nope. the next high, nope. the next buzz, nope. getting drunk, using drugs, nope. and on and on and on. They pursued everything else, but somehow they stumbled over Jesus. Thank you. See, there's many that will be stripped of their self-righteousness and nothing will be left but their unforgiven sin. Amen. They will see Jesus, and they will bow before him. But in that day, it will be too late. They will have nothing to say. They will be without excuse to give. They will have no claim to make before Almighty God. Because they refuse the Son of God in this life, God will refuse them in the next. They will go into eternal darkness. They will be led away from the presence of Almighty God. And in that day, their guilt will be so great that they will pray for a mountain to fall on them or a flood to wash them away from the very presence of Almighty God. All because of one thing. Because they stumbled over Jesus. My suggestion, my strong suggestion for you this morning is don't let that happen right. to you. Amen. Build your life on the rock. Yes. Make sure that you are trusting in Jesus Christ yes. and in Him alone. And let me ask the question very pointedly. Who is Jesus to you? Think about that for a moment. Who is Jesus to you? See, is Jesus a stumbling stone? No. Or is Jesus a cornerstone? A cornerstone. Are you standing on the rock of Jesus Christ? Or are you stumbling over it? There's only two possibilities. You're either stumbling over him, or you're standing upon the rock that is Jesus Christ. I implore you this morning to build your life on the rock. Make Jesus the cornerstone of your life. Stand on him. Build upon him. Let him bear the weight of all the things that you have in your life. Rest everything you have on Jesus. And you will never be ashamed. And you will be shouting in glory when you get there. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father, Father, I thank you. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what you've already done. I thank you for this precious text from Romans chapter 9. Father, bless us with wisdom and understanding. Lord, we have to get to the point where we realize it's Jesus only. Amen. Nothing needs to be added. Nothing needs to be put with you. We have to accept that gift and stand on you as the cornerstone. Otherwise, we'll stumble, and some of us won't even realize that we've missed heaven. If you miss it by an inch, you might as well miss it by a mile. Amen. Bless us, Lord. Bless us. Help us see that you are the cornerstone, that you are the only way, the only truth, and the only life. There's only one way. I don't care who tells you otherwise. I don't care if it's a billion dollar talk show host or if it's a guy in the street corner. There is only one way. His name is Jesus. Let us embrace that as our reality. I pray this in Jesus' name. And all the saints said, Amen. Amen. Amen.